So uh, welcome everyone. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, who is Brenda Monkler. She did her undergraduate degree at Cornell and went on to the University of California. After that, she did a short postdoc at UCLA and is now a fellow at Carnegie. She is one of the main authors of the third master. People are generally really like her calculations. And today she will tell us about how she did Take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sophie. We're actually academic siblings, technically, even though Sophie was in Copenhagen during most of her PhD. So that's lovely to see you again. Um, so thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm Brenna Mokler. Um, as Sophie said, I'm currently at Carnegie, but I also have this affiliation with UCLA. Um, and today I'll be talking about how we can use tidal destruction events to learn about the black holes and stars in the centers of galaxies. Um, so I'm going to start with just a brief overview for people who don't think about this as much as me and show a simulation. Um, Blazers don't show up on the screen. Oh, okay. So there's a Oh, perfect. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we have a black hole here and a star here. The star comes in, is disrupted at pericenter, is on a pretty eccentric orbit, and then part of this debris is going to fall back in a crete, and that's going to produce the flare that we actually observe. Um, and so TDEs can help us determine the properties of both the stars and the black hole in the centers of galaxies on the black hole side. We can learn about the mass, the accretion efficiency, in some cases, even the spin of these black holes. Um, and for stars, uh, we can learn about the properties of the stars as well as their dynamics on size scales that are really difficult to probe outside our own galactic neighborhood. And so I'll just jump into some of the motivation for why we're particularly excited about using TDEs to do this. Uh, first of all, as we know, it's difficult to weigh small supermassive black holes. I mean, this is just because we mostly rely on kinematic measurements. And so as the black hole's mass goes down, um, it has less of an effect on the stars and gas surrounding it. Um, and you can see this very clearly if you look at the M sigma relation using dynamical measurements. This is McConnell and Ma's 2013 relation. And there's just a lot fewer measurements below around 10 to the seven solar masses. Um, and this is actually where TDEs are preferentially observable. Um, and this is because um, partly due to rates, but also because at higher masses, um, you start the, the star is disrupted within the event horizon of the black hole. And so this is spin dependent, but generally occurs around 10 to the eight solar masses for most of these stars. Um, and so, of course, we can see black holes in general when they're accreting mass, even at smaller masses. Um, but if we want to understand the black hole mass function better, um, most local massive black holes are quiescent. And that's what this plot is showing. So we have the relative number of black holes, the mass of the black holes. Um, and then I'm just going to, this is a bit busy, so just focus on the green lines. So we have active galaxies from Green and Ho down here. And you have to multiply this line by a factor of um, almost 200 to match the line from all galaxies and the uncertainty on the low mass I'm sorry, it's just our uncertainty in the black um, and whether or not all of these galaxies post black holes. And so people are actually already starting to use TDEs to measure this, um, this black hole mass function. And so this is a plot from uh, Stuart Van Belsen's 2020 review paper, where you have the TDE rate versus black hole mass plotted as these scatter points. Um, and then the dashed line is the, um, is the black hole mass function, the theoretical black hole mass function. And you can already see, start to see this drop off here, which we think is due to hill capture and also pretty good um, um, agreement, at least with the shape of the black hole mass function at lower masses. And in fact, a very recent paper, um, Yao et al. 2023, um, tried to uh, use the ZTF TDE demographics to actually try to extend the observations of the black hole mass function down to lower masses. And that's what you're seeing, this gray shaded region where we have some theoretical calculations, some observations from other um, from Shankar papers up here, and then the, um, the TDE limit here in gray. Hello, Tete. Okay, um, so we care. So TDEs can help us learn about the masses of black holes. They can also tell us a lot 
about the properties of the stars. And this is on size scales within the sphere of influence, so of order less than one parsec. And so we can look at stars on those size scales in our own galactic center. And so the UCLA Galactic Center Group has obviously done a lot of work on this. But we can't observe stars on this size scales outside our own galactic neighborhood. And so TDEs are unique in letting us do this. And so before I go through uh, so those some motivation, and before I go through more of the research and results, here's a brief outline. Uh, first, I'm going to talk more about light curve models, uh, various different light curve models, and how they help us constrain black hole mass. Then we'll talk about luminosity production and the theoretical debate uh, around uh, where most of the luminosity is coming from at different points in these events. And finally, uh, talk some about stellar properties and constraints we can get, and if we have time, briefly touch on supermassive black hole binaries. Okay, so when I talk about uh, modeling tidal disruption events, um, I like to break it into two different parts. Uh, first, the disruption and the mass fallback, and so this is the energy source for this transient. Um, and then second, the actual production of luminosity around the black hole and the reprocessing of this luminosity into the observed wavelengths that we actually observe. That we actually see. And this is just a plot of uh, the model that I did, a bunch of light curve fits. Uh, from my 2019 paper. And so if we go through these different parts of the TDE process in more detail, first, again, we have disruption. This is snapshots from a different simulation where you have a star in a very eccentric orbit. It's disrupted at pericenter. Part of that gas is bound to the black hole. Part of it's heading off into space, um, and the bound gas will form, eventually form a disk and produce a flare. And then just one thing, um, so I'm gonna talk about the tidal radius later. That's just a, a Hill's radius argument where the tidal force is equivalent to the self grav or approximately equivalent to the self gravity of the star. Um, so it's about where the disruption is occurring. Okay, I'm gonna show the simulation I showed earlier, but here I've plotted on top of it, um, just several different possible orbits. And the reason I do that is I think it's nice I think it shows nicely how you can see that material returning at later times is returning on much longer orbits. It makes sense, it's taking longer to return. Um, but this is really defining the mass energy distribution in the debris, which has important implications for the light curve. So you can see material coming back at later times is following these more um, loosely bound orbits. And so this mass fallback rate, which is feeding the black hole and providing our luminosity source, DMDT, can be broken up into two different components, this mass energy distribution, and then the orbital time scale, which can mostly be determined analytically. But then this mass energy distribution, DMDE, is determined by the hydrodynamics of disruption. And so it's really why we run these simulations of the disruption process. And so if you look at this snapshot of a disrupted star, um, this is the, this tail is bound to the black hole. And so the time of mass return increases as you go from the outermost layers of the star in towards the core. In this case, there's a, a remaining core. Um, and so um, just determined by the, the orbital um, energy of the debris. And so um, Theoretically, we predicted um, that we'd have this dependence from the mass fallback rate on the black hole mass. Um, and that's because, because of the relation, um, because of the, the dependence on the orbital energy. And so this is a plot of the mass fallback rate for the disruption of a one solar mass black hole by a 10 to the five solar mass, or a one solar mass star by a 10 to the five solar mass black hole. And if we increase the black hole mass, you can clearly see this dependence in the mass fallback rate. And so this is the feeding source for the, um, for the event. Um, and and on, the, on the orbit? So an important note here, it would, except for the majority of these are coming from nearly parabolic orbit. And so once you're approaching the yeah, eccentricity of one, it doesn't, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's true for more bound. And so for like some of the repeated TDEs that I'm not talking about here, but those might be more bound and then it would be more important. Um, okay, so there's many hydro simulations of this disruption process covering a wide range of parameter space, varying the properties of the star, um, 
uh, going into the importance of GR for very, very deep disruptions that are occurring close to the event horizon, um, and also looking at um, different types, not just main sequence stars. Um, however, um, this mass fallback rate doesn't actually tell us what we were expecting to see after this transient. And so we actually need to understand how the mass is converted into the luminosity as well. And so the general picture is that we have debris streams that collide and lose orbital energy, and they eventually form an accretion disk. And both of these processes can release energy or will release energy. Um, however, there's a very few number of end-to-end uh, -end simulations that go from disruption to disformation and luminosity production. And so we're not super clear on if most of the luminosity is coming from the disk or from stream collisions at different points in this process. Um, the reason for the few number is simply because you have to spend orders of magnitude in physical space if you're tracking material from disruption all the way to uh, out to uh, alpha center and then back to fallback. Um, and so, yes, as I was saying, this means that we're not really sure where most of the luminosity is coming from at different times, although there's been a lot more work studying this more recently. And so I'm going to show some simulations from Clement Bonnereau, who's done a lot of work analyzing this um, and talking about the circularization process. So debris streams um, collide and circularize, and then we're actually seeing, um, and then most of the luminosity is going to be produced close to the black hole's radius. Um, and so how quickly and how efficiently these debris streams can lose energy and form a disk really informs where the luminosity is coming from. And so this is just an example of slow circularization um, where the debris streams don't collide very quickly and don't emit much energy quickly. And then we have fast circularization over here where the circularization time scale is less than the fallback time scale. And so in this case, you'd expect very prompt emission. Can you say a little bit more about the simulations? <laughs> because I'm really frustrated now. That was seven years ago. Yeah, these, these, are, these are old simulations, and I'm going to actually show some of Clement's more recent okay. simulations, but I think they illustrate the general idea of like the, the fact that what we care about here is whether the circularization time is smaller or larger than the fallback time when um, thinking about how prompt the emission is. Um, and so, uh, well, uh, an interesting point here is most of these events um, have significant optical and UV emission. And so naively, when we were first looking for TDEs, um, not me, but other people were first looking for TDEs, they expected them to mostly be X-ray bright like AGN. And so this implies that unlike an AGN, we're not actually looking directly at the source of the emission. Um, but when you think about the sheer amount of mass returning to the black hole, these are often very super Eddington accretors, this actually makes sense. There's a lot of material around to reprocess um, the initial emission. And so a much more recent simulation from the wanted audience um, showing the stream collisions and the, uh, the eventual forming accretion disk um, shows that you get a lot of mass and outflows and winds surrounding the black hole, but it also noticeably sh um, notably shows that you're able to relatively quickly form an accretion disk by losing energy in the stream collisions. Um, and I just want to note that this simulation is centered on the um, debris stream collision point, but um, if you were to put in a processing debris stream, it might look something like this. So the stream collision, and actually, I don't think I noted this earlier, the reason that um, the simulation earlier is um, able to, the streams are able to collide quickly is because it's, rel it's, relativi it's relatively relativistic. It's close enough to the black hole that you have enough precession that these debris streams can intersect quickly. And that's what you'd see here. So I'm just going to show this simulation. And you can see as soon as there's stream collisions, you get this outflow, and then you get this forming accretion disk as well. And so if we break this up into its different components, we have this initial debris stream and uh, stream collisions. We have a forming accretion disk. Outside of this all, we have wind and outflows, both driven by stream collisions at early times and at later times by the disk potentially. But then we also have this evolving photosphere, because if we were to try to look through this gas, at some point it would become optically thick. And in fact, um, this often obscures the source of the emission. And instead, what we're observing um, is an evolving photosphere, which is determining the optical and UV luminosities. 
And so you can imagine this makes it difficult to model these events if you're trying to model the source of the luminosity. Um, and there's been multiple, um, there's many different models that uh, try to try to model these events and constrain, for example, the black hole mass. But most of them, uh, to do this, they assume some sort of luminosity production mechanism. And so, for example, on the top here, we have this really great accretion disk modeling, but it's relying on the few events that have enough X-ray detections to actually model this. And so for some events, you actually can see through that reprocessing layer enough, um, maybe it's a spherical, um, that you can actually get X-ray detections and you can model this disk, but this isn't true for most of the events. And then alternatively, you can also just assume, for example, this paper is assuming a stream collision luminosity production happening inside the reprocessing layer. And so uh, when, because of the uncertainty in the luminosity production, when I first uh, made this TDE model in MOSFET that Sophie mentioned, we actually tried to stay relatively agnostic of the source of the luminosity. So we know in either case, it's powered by the initial fallback of debris streams. And then in this model, for example, we included a sort of viscous delay reminiscent of what we'd expect from a building accretion disk, but we allowed the viscous time scale to vary a lot. Um, and then we also included, um, we, we allowed the efficiency and photosphere evolution to, um, to cover a range of values that would both model extreme uh, collisions or the accretion disk. And what we found uh, through this modeling is it seems like for the most part, the luminosity is following the fallback rate. Um, and noticeably at early times, it seems like there isn't the vis, if there is um, a disk, the viscosity uh, is time scale is relatively small, is smaller than the peak time scale. So basically the dominant um, time scale here is coming from the fallback rate and not from a disk. And so this is great when modeling the evolution of the light curve because it means that the light curve evolution is dependent on the black hole mass. Um, and this is just the relation I showed earlier. How, how, is that, how does that work? I would have thought that the, the job of the disk, so to speak, is like as a buffer, and, and, and you cannot get rid of a momentum, you are not going to create. How come the stream energy is you know, Yeah, so I think that probably a lot of the original luminosity, we'll talk more about the source of luminosity later, but I think um, you're getting significant luminosity from, um, part of this is that the, um, it's just two points. One is that the you're you're getting a lot of disk. Um, the orbital time scale of, at the disk is much much smaller than the the time scale of mass falling back. So you can have multiple disk um, orbits, both as um, compared to like how long it takes the material to fall back. So um, that allows for um, you to lose more angular momentum more quickly. But I think another important point is that actually. A lot of what we're probably seeing at early times is the process of forming the disk and the circularization process. So as the material is hitting the outer edge of the disk and starting to form that disk, um, that's producing a lot of luminosity too. And that's actually why, as I'll talk about later, I think that it's um, the best way to think about this is the basically the radius from the black hole where the luminosity is being produced. Um, and also just because in principle, every, all of these mechanisms are producing luminosity, it's just like how much and at what times. I think it's best to think about um, where most of it's being produced. Um, May I ask another question? Yeah. Uh, so one of the conclusions in the previous slide that the luminosity you expect from MOSFET is oh. that it falls more or less the fallback rate. But to what level is it imposed by how the light curve is created? Because I can think of the stream comes back as a fallback rate, but then the way that this forms may actually put the degree that is the most bound on very, very you know, high energy of it so that it comes back from the disk later on. So, so I would kind of mix between different energy levels. Of I think that that is, I think that that is affecting things on the rise. I don't think it's affecting things on the decline as much just because of the, the time scales here, but I'm actually going to mention some updates that we're kind of thinking of doing in the code in a couple slides. Um, and one of them actually, which what I think is maybe even more important than that is the just the diffusion time scale at early times, which is going to be slightly different from a disk time scale, and so that is something that we're looking at. Um, yeah, but um, okay. So back to this. So so for if we look at luminosity curves from some of these events, it does seem like the uh, large we can we can see by eye that the luminosity curve from the larger black hole um, is spread out, and the one from the smaller black hole is um, is shorter. 
following this T to the, or this relation with black hole mass that I just discussed. And in fact, it does seem like this mostly tracks with what we expect from the M sigma relation. Um, on the left, I'm showing the M sigma relation from before, and you can see our points from TDEs are mostly off the plot. On the right, um, the dynamical measurements are up here. And the measurements um, down here are from AGN, which are much more covering the same part of parameter space as TDEs, so they're better for uh, comparing. And I also just wanted to shout out this other paper um, from uh, Paige Ramsden, which compares with the uh, M bulge relation. And so you can see that there's a lot more spread, particularly at lower masses, in both the TDEs and the sample at large, um, but it does seem to be mostly consistent. Um, and of course, there's uncertainties with how much both relations follow their higher mass, how, how much these relations are consistent at lower masses, but um, so far they seem consistent enough for this. Uh, one thing I wanted to note is I briefly mentioned accretion disfitting earlier, and there aren't that many TDEs that we can do this with, but two of them that we can, Assassin 14 LI and Assassin 15 OI, um, we get masses that are consistent from light curve fading with what they get from accretion disk fading. So these are a couple events where there are more x-rays, um, but um, our constraints on the black hole mass can help them improve their spin constraints, which is nice. Um, yeah, so one of the, as I was mentioning earlier, Clint, um, there, are next, there are things that we'd like to do to improve this model. One of them actually is just um, doing a better treatment of diffusion on the rise of the light curve. And to that end, I'm running some radiation transfer simulations to better understand this. But then also, like Clement was saying, um, it'd be nice to actually um, take kind of the results from these early circularization simulations um, and see what they produce um, as a function of time and quants on this a bit. Um, but I'd really like to, again, take the radiation transfer code that I'm working with um, and reprocess on the simulation data to, to see how it affects the rise of the light curve. And so again, the reason I think it affects the, the decline less is simply because the time scales are longer. And so um, if there is some mixing, I think it would be less important. Um, so we can start to constrain the black hole mass with this variety of models, but it'd be great if we could also constrain properties like the mass of the star and the accretion efficiency. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to talk about the creation efficiency first, where I'm, this is a very broad uh, kind of overall efficiency where it's just the luminosity divided by m dot c squared. And so it's a fraction of rest mass energy that is converted to luminosity. And it can be broke, into mul broke up into multiple component efficiencies, but we'll use this overall average efficiency for now. Um, and so this is also what I was talking about before, where I think that really the question that we want to ask here is where does most of the luminosity coming from? Because that's really determining the scale of the efficiency. Um, and so a lot of these debris stream collision models are actually assuming that the collisions occur around apocenter, um, whereas if the most of the luminosity is coming from the buildup of the accretion disk and then from the, the disk, those are going to be at the scale of the accretion disk or the circularization radius. Um, and so if we go back to this general picture that I showed before, um, that shows the geometry of the gas, we can um, create a little schematic. Oh, wait, actually, it's a different. <laughs> we can pick up first, we can pick out the different components of the, um, from this. And so at small radii, we have a processing debris stream and an accretion disk. And then at larger radii here, we have these stream collisions. And so we can compare the efficiency that we would expect from these different processes by looking um, at the efficiency versus the accretion disk radius. And so the reason I like to plot this versus disk radius is just what I was implying before. Um, we can estimate the efficiency at the edge of the accretion disk radius and use this as a sort of limit where if the uh, efficiencies are less than this, they might come from outside the disk, but if they are more than this, then it's really hard to explain them as collisions at the apocenter. Can you say how each of these points is placed in this diagram? Yeah, so these points um, have very large uncertainties, but they're from um, light curve fitting where um, we are including the mass of the star and the efficiency as parameters. Um, but there's a very big degeneracy between those two parameters I'll discuss later, which is causing the large uncertainties. 
Um, and so all of these points above this shade, gray shaded region are consistent with emission inside the disk. And these points down here are consistent with mission outside the disk. And so basically what we find is there are really large uncertainties, but it seems like for the most part from our modeling, um, the, we're getting efficiencies that are more consistent with uh, shocks um, and accretion disk emission um, or shocks at the scale of the accretion disk than they are with stream collisions at very large radii. Um, and in fact, we can also just compare this with other creating black holes. And so this is a plot in the background from Davis and Lauer's 2011 paper, where all the gray regions are AGN, um, and the TDEs on top of it are in blue. And just to note, a super Eddington efficiency um, from various or expected from various simulations is in red here. And you can see about half of the efficiencies that we're getting are basically overlapping with the AGN. Some are smaller, but even a subset of these appear to be too efficient to come from radii um, outside of the circularization radius. So maybe they're from that circularizing process itself. Oh, and then one other thing to note is that in, um, this is kind of an aside, but this recent paper by Tiao Hong in 2020 actually has this really nice result where they see a disk uh, signature in, um, in the spectra. And so you can see the double peak line profile. Um, one thing to note is generally, if it was a circular disk, you'd expect the blue shift to be higher, but this is actually really well modeled with an eccentric disk where you can get the red shift to be higher. Sorry, uh, but we think that the emission is actually this goes through the reprocessing area, right? We do, but uh, uh, so, so in a few cases, you actually can see x-rays or you can see disk emission. So the, the reprocess, it seems like for the majority of these events, most of the emission is going through the reprocessing layer, but at least in some cases, we can see directly through the disk as evidenced by. So, uh, in this case, uh, this is you, yeah, this is optical, not x -ray. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you, in this case, uh, do you, why, what is the evidence for the emission from the that disk in this case? Um, I, I thought that there was also x-ray emission with this, I kind of, um, but I think that they're basically assuming that you're also, that there's, there's more rotation on larger scales as well, but that's a good point, actually. Um, Do you have a continuum in this case, right? I don't know, I just kind of threw this in at the end because I thought it was an intro, but yeah, but we can talk more later about it, yeah, um, definitely. Is it not possible to uh, constrain the radius by looking at the length of five? Yeah, you can estimate the radius as well. Um, and I, again, I'm not sure exactly what they get for this. Yeah. It was a scale of the orbital curve and the screen. Which seems a bit too large for this. That's fair. Um, okay, well, maybe maybe this is not a good example, but I did. Um, but but I think what is the very clear example, or not clear, a very a good example is the X-ray um, that we see in a few of these events, where um, that in some cases can be fit with disk models. Um, but back to what I was talking about before, um, I was mentioning we have these very large uncertainties, and this is in these models that are agnostic. If we assume some sort of disk model, then we could get a disk mass from that, which would put some constraints on the mass of the star. Um, but um, but there'd still be large uncertainties. And so the, the uncertainties here in this efficiency mass, um, stellar mass plane, are essentially on long lines of constant energy. And so the degenerate does, the degeneracy doesn't affect the total energy, um, which is good, but it does mean that it's difficult to, to constrain the different parameters separately. And so to that end, um, I've recently been thinking about how we can use spectra to better constrain the mass of the stars. And this plot, this is a plot of TD spectra. This is a plot of the uh, composition ratios uh, for various um, ages of a one solar mass star. Um, so we know that nitrogen and carbon abundance and other metallicities increase with mass and age. We can see that this, that's essentially what this plot is showing where we have the mass of the star, age of the star, composition ratio is going from blue to red as it increases. But can we actually observe this effect in TDEs? And so I think it's important to go back to this picture of uh, the geometry of the gas surrounding the event. And if we take uh, the, if we make a little diagram of the key components, we can see here that we have the debris stream, the evolving photosphere, and the wind. 
And actually, we expect the spectral lines to form somewhere around here for the most part, where it's not optically thick. Of course, unless you're looking through directly the disk, as people have mentioned. Um, and so we can actually use our modeling to estimate where these radii are for real events. Um, we have a photosphere radius, debris stream, wind. Um, the wind is just an approximation based on some of these events that do have um, outflow line velocity measurements. So I put it in as 0.1c, but starting at the time when mass is falling back to the black hole for the first time. And so this region where we expect observable debris to be, debris to be is between the photosphere and the wind radius. And so this point, um, and so if this material was coming from, up, if this material was already there before the, uh, before the TDE, we might expect it to be outside the wind radius. We might expect the line widths that we observe to be smaller. But in fact, if we assume a virial radius from full width half max lines, we find that the lines are somewhere in here. And so this could be due to rotation. It could also just be the line broadening due to optical depth effects. But either way, it's really hard to explain them as being much further out where we'd expect them to be if there was like a pre-existing AGN. And so it seems like the lines are more consistent with what we'd expect if it's coming, if this um, material is actually coming from the TDE. And you'll note I'm actually plotting nitrogen lines here, not just uh, like H alpha or something. And so that motivates this next part, which is that we actually do see uh, nitrogen and carbon lines in many of these spectra. However, it's not necessarily straightforward to go from uh, spectra to spectral ratios to composition ratios. Depends a lot on the um, properties of the gas. And so here we get lucky. And for a few of these events, we actually have uh, UV HST line ratios measured. Uh, so this nitrogen three to carbon three UV ratio has similar ionization potentials and critical densities. So we think it's probably forming in a similar part of the gas and is less dependent on gas conditions, easier to convert to a composition ratio. Um, and in fact, um, there's recent work by Yang et al 2017 that showed that for a few of these events, it seems like the nitrogen to carbon ratio is greater than 10 times solar. Um, what does this mean for the mass and age of the star? Well, you can see this plot here. I've shaded in gray this region with nitrogen to carbon greater than 10. And it limits us to stars that are either, that are greater than one or two solar masses. And if they're in the smaller end, they have to be very, very evolved. Um, but how, um, what does this actually mean for the, the stars that we're disrupting? This doesn't seem like a particularly strong constraint, or it didn't to me at first. However, uh, we see about 3% of TDEs with this, um, but only 0.05% of the galaxy stellar population has stars in this mass range. And this is actually using the uh, star formation histories for these galaxies and including recent star bursts. And that's just because the IMF is very bottom heavy and in general, we expect TDEs to just kind of randomly come from the, the current mass function um, in the galactic nucleus. And so there's multiple possible explanations for this. Um, I don't think we have a preferred one yet. One though, is that we would expect the star formation process um, to potentially be, well, we would expect it to be centrally concentrated. It's also possible it could be top heavy. And if you include a very centrally concentrated star formation uh, in, or a starburst that's also top heavy, you can start to explain the percentages, um, very low number statistics, but still. Um, and specifically, when I'm talking about a top heavy IMF here, I'm talking about IMFs like um, has been seen in the galactic center. So this is the relative number of stars versus stellar mass and the Coupe IMF just for comparison. Galactic center IMF in blue. And then in orange here is what happens if you just assume that you're only forming stars above 0.5 solar masses in the galactic center. And so there's been theoretical papers predicting what sort of IMFs you'd expect in both galactic nuclei and starburst environments. Um, and so what we're seeing is if you want to explain this with the star formation process only, you'd need um, this orange, um, very top heavy galactic IMF and a very, very centrally concentrated starburst. There's other possible explanations here. Um, there's, for example, we'd expect there to be more stellar interactions in the galactic nuclei. People have been, there's a lot of recent papers on this. Um, so with mass transfer or collisions, actually, uh, you could change the current population of stars um, separately from just the IMF. So you could potentially create more massive and more rejuvenated stars. 
Um, also with uh, stripping of stars, you could potentially uh, increase the relative abundance of higher metallicity elements if you're taking off the lower metallicity envelope of the star. And there's actually an interesting paper on collisions coming up soon from a grad student at UCLA, Sanaya Rose. I think Itai might yeah, also be on that paper as well. That shows that you get, if you include collisions in the galactic nucleus, you get um, more higher mass stars. I don't know what the time is. Oh, wait, was there a question? Yes. Yeah. So uh, aside from the IMF, um, like more massive stars that tend to segregate deeper in the potential of the supermassive black hole and possibly their rates. So we did look at mass segregation. Um, and if you just go in from like two body relaxation, it's not enough um, to explain what we're seeing, mostly because um, mass segregation is going to be really noticeable for like 10 solar mass stars, but there's almost no 10 solar mass stars, maybe more with collisions. Um, and it's less um, efficient for, um, for the smaller stars um, that are closer to the peak of the current mass function, um, just because the speed at which they segregate is related to the ratio there. Um, and another thing actually that we also included, um, some people have asked me before if, um, including the fact that the you're able to disrupt higher mass stars slightly larger out helps. And we do include that in the percentages before, but um, it's not enough of an effect to change things much. Um, I don't know what my time is. I'm three minutes. Oh, okay, great. I was gonna go try to go to 45, but um, so I do have plenty of time for this last section. Um, okay, so at the end, I kind of wanted to pivot a little bit and talk about this recent work. Um, with a grad student at UCLA, a different grad student at UCLA, on TDEs from supermassive black hole binaries. <laughs> and so the picture here is that these black holes are separated by a order of their sphere of influence. Um, at the size scales, where you're starting to have lots of interactions. And so you're able to increase the rates of TDEs um, in, in these black holes. And so this has been thought about a lot before, um, both through thinking about coherent orbital excitations, um, the cosi lighting mechanism, also thinking about chaotic scatterings when the secondary black hole gets close enough um, to stars in the sphere of influence of the primary black hole that there's hard scattering events and you get more TDUs. Um, but if we focus, if we, if we look at the coherent orbital excitations, uh, it's actually hard to get um, very high eccentricities for a lot of these stars around the larger black hole because the precession time scales, uh, both from general relativity and also precession due to the stellar cusp, um, end up being a lot smaller than the cosi lido time scale over much of the parameter space. And so they suppress the excitations that you would normally build up with cosi lido, um, and so you get less disruptions. And so most of the, this previous work has found that around the larger black hole, most of the TDEs are coming from these chaotic scatterings. Um, however, if you instead look at the smaller black hole, these timescales look a lot better. Um, the cosi lido time scale is much shorter than the GR time scale, and it's also comparable or shorter than the cusp time scale, such that we don't think it would be wiping out these um, eccentricity buildups so much. Um, and so in a, a recent a couple papers that we're about to put out, we focus on the smaller black hole. Um, which is particularly interesting for us because we think that TDEs from the smaller black hole can pot potentially help us find hidden supermassive black hole binaries. And so the motivation is the work that I talked about earlier, where if you have a supermassive black hole binary and you have a TDE from the larger black hole, it's going to look like uh, the TDE light curve is pretty consistent with the mass that you'd expect from galaxy scaling relations. But if the black hole mass is of order 10 or less uh, or, or more smaller than the larger black hole, then the light curve will look a lot smaller. Um, and so if we see this, we might, uh, we might see this as a sign of a hidden supermassive black hole binary. And of course, at the extreme end, if you get a TDE uh, in a galaxy where the uh, black hole mass seems to be too large to host a TDE, so about 10 to the eight solar masses or so, or um, then this would be a very good indicator of a potential supermassive black hole binary. And so we ran a bunch of these simulations um, of this triple system 
and we get very extreme coxilitive oscillations. This is actually from a previous paper, but it looks pretty similar. Where here I'm plotting one minus eccentricity just to um, show you how large of eccentricities we're getting. So uh, yeah. Um, and so on this right plot here, you see the results of one of our simulations where you get all of these stars under this purple line become TDEs. Um, and so it just depends on some major axis how high of eccentricity you need. Um, and so what we find is we get these bursts of TDEs as has previously been predicted around supermassive black hole binaries, um, but we get it looking at the smaller black hole. Um, and it's dependent on the mass of the black hole. A lot of this is just because the number of stars in the nuclear star cluster is dependent on the mass of the black hole. And so in fact, also the reason why this looks bursty is because at some point you run out of stars. So if you had some replenishing mechanism, you could uh, flatten that out at later times. But I think the important thing to note here is that we get rates that are up order, uh, the observed rates are higher for tens to hundreds of millions of years in many of these cases. And so we do expect to see some of these events, um, especially as we're increasing the, the number of transient surveys that are searching for TEs. And also because these would also be happening near the centers of galaxies, um, whereas, yeah, so, so they'd hopefully be found with normal TDE surveys. And then one other thing I just wanted to know is if you look at the total number of TDEs versus black hole mass, this is dependent on your approximations for the stellar nuclear cluster. This is from the smaller black hole. Um, and this is from mostly chaotic orbital crossings from the larger black hole. And so we get less, I mean, there's more uncertainty here. Um, as we vary our parameters, we get less, but they're only a factor of a few less um, on the, uh, at our lower limits. And it's pretty comparable at our higher limits. Um, and so we do expect, it's not like we're just seeing stars in a larger mass black hole, we expect to see them from both. Um, and right about at 45, I'll leave you with my takeaways. Um, so TDEs can teach us about a lot of different parts of uh, the galactic nucleus, both about what's happening at the scale of the black hole, but also hopefully about the stars um, and potentially about the merger history if we can look at binaries as well. And then also, I just want to say that uh, right now we still have of order 100 or less confirmed TDEs, depending on how optimistic you are about all the candidates. Um, but the number of TDEs we're finding per year is increasing dramatically, particularly with CTF. We expect this number to explode with Vera Rubin, although confirming them may be difficult. Um, and so hopefully a lot of these things where we have really low number statistics will actually have much higher number statistics in like a few years' time. We have plenty of time for questions. So, yeah. So, so, sorry, you may have said this, but I just thought of this question now. Um, in terms of rates, mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a two part question. So, 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 the context for this is I'm wondering um, if we had something like the EHT, but it were better resolution by a factor of 10, let's say, um, how. Uh, Feasible would it be to find to, to like see one of how likely would it be to see one of these? What's the range? If we found some system that we said we expect to see it, we just stare at that for a year. So the average, it depends on the galaxy properties. The average is about 10 to the minus four per galaxy per year. So I think what we would want to do in that case is look at things where or look at galaxies where we are seeing much higher rates. Um, theoretically, we expect the rate to increase at smaller black um, black hole mass, but then if these are ending to limited, that might be more difficult. Um, although I guess if you have that other solution, maybe not. Um, but for example, we're seeing a lot of these in these post-starburst galaxies, um, which I sort of glossed over when I was talking about the mass of the stars. But um, yeah, we see a lot more in post-starburst galaxies. We're not fully sure why this is, um, but that would be a good candidate for looking at um, because the rates there may be of order, I want to say 100 times higher. Of course, then one every 100 years still isn't great. So. Um, so I think, I think it would be difficult to make the case for staring at a single galaxy. Yeah. 
So when you said that the Ruby Arrow expects to observe southern, but to, in this case, how do you what do you learn? The classification is sometimes tricky, right? Mm. What is the rate that we'd expect to pass yeah, by them? Yeah, it depends how many we get spectra of a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the issues with Ruben here um, is these events most, well, the optical and UV events that we'd expect Ruben to discover mostly peak actually at UV wavelength. Um, and if you only get red bands, they look a lot, sim they look very similar to a lot of supernova. And so if you can get, if you can get very blue bands, um, even if you could get like good hue and B coverage, then you'd probably be able to pull these out more easily. I don't know that we're going to get good coverage with Ruben for a lot of these. So, um, but I, I want to say that this, no, this actually does take into account the band coverage this number does. It doesn't necessarily take into account the number you'd expect to also get spectra of. Right. So that in, in this sense, it's a more kind of ambiguous, right? Because they usually, if you want to they do the more, Classification in a robust way, then you need the spec sorry, the spectroscopic observation, the which may not be available all the way. That's true. I think um I do think that if we get blue bands, we can rule out almost most supernova with very high likelihood. There's possible possibly F bots um, or other transient, possible optical transients that would populate that same region of parameter space. Um, but the yeah, if you, if you get the time scale and the evolution in blue bands, you can rule out, rule out most supernova. And it's possible that F bots are coming from like smaller black holes or some other sort of compact object transient. Yeah, so it makes it right? But yeah, yeah, no, there's a lot of different perspectives on what, and I'm sure it also depends on the F bot what those could be. Um, but I actually do think that even without spectra, if we get the blue coverage and the, the time coverage, um, we could do a pretty good job. Yeah. So I was wondering, you showed your relation with the over time uh -huh. the black hole. Does that depend at all on like what you what process you assume is producing it? I didn't quite understand if it's a disk or a disk for the street. Yeah. Um, so it does in principle. Um, but so if it if if it's mostly produced by stream collisions, you would expect it to mostly track the fallback rate, which it does. However, it does seem like these are more efficient than what we'd expect from stream collisions at large radii. Um, if there is, um, as multiple people have pointed out, and as I was mentioning earlier on, if um, if it's mostly coming from a disk, then you have to worry about how quickly you can lose angular momentum to produce the luminosity that you're seeing. I think what makes a lot of sense at early time, and I don't think that's an issue at later times once the fallback time scale is longer, but at early times when things are changing rapidly, um, I think that it makes the most sense that it's coming from the process of creating this accretion disk. So maybe shocks on the order of the size of the accretion disk. And this is kind of what some of Clement's some simulations and other people's simulations are showing is that you very quickly start to circularize material, but you're not in like a classic disk uh, for, a, for a little bit. Yeah, so, but again, this is why I think, I mean, simulations can do this, but I think when we're fitting models to it, I think it makes more sense to, to think about just the scale of where this process is occurring, because we're never going to have, well, we might at very late times have a classic thin disk, but these disks at earlier times are very puffy and um, optically thick. Um, in the, in the quasi lead off, mm -hmm. do you expect that to go through a period of quasi periodic eruptions, in the, or does the star just get pushed into the fabulous orbiting zone in one orbit? immediately disrupt just go through a period where it's being stripped a little bit and then flying gets disrupted. So that depends. Um, I think that um, so because we're doing this um, this more analytical treatment, uh, I don't no, we're not necessarily capped. There's there's a cosi light of oscillations and then there's like little oscillations that you get on top of that um, that you see in some of these um, um, and these embodied calculations that we're not resolving. And I think that those in principle could move you into and out of that, that region of parameter space. But the change, I think the change in eccentricity um, between different closed eye of oscillations is probably gonna be enough that you'll just get a disruption. Or, or if you get a partial disruption first, you're going to be on such a long orbit that it won't look like the quasi-periodic eruptions because the orbital time scales will be like, hundreds of years. So like you might get a partial disruption and then disruption. Um, so, but actually um, a point on that is that 
that I don't think I mentioned is that I'm working with this student to include two body relaxation. And with that, she's actually able to get more of these COSI light of induced TDEs at, that start at smaller or that have smaller semi-major axes. And so then you can potentially start getting orbital time scales that are less and that are maybe more relevant to this sort of QPO scenario. Although I still think they're pretty long compared to a lot of the ones we've seen. Um, so it seems, yeah, it seems like I know a lot of people think about um, like stellar binaries coming in and explaining the, um, if you have a stellar binary come in, if the binary is disrupted, one of the stars is on a much more circular orbit and it loses angular momentum that way. Um, so it's able to um, have a smaller orbital period, yeah. We don't have any more questions. Um, Brenda is here today and tomorrow. We can go and talk to him. Uh, and then let's thank you.